Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you today, Sunday, at two presentations focused on growth in Virginia and the Northern Act 2020. As you know, there's a lot happening in the news today, not only on the coronavirus threat, but also on the stock market and the economy. Today's session is about the economy, but with a focus on where we live in Virginia and Eastern Virginia in particular. How is the local economy performing and where is it headed? To guide us in this examination is our speaker, Sonia Waddell. Sonia joins us from the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, where she serves as Vice President of Economist Regional and Community Analysis. Can you so you joined the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond's okay. research department in January 2008. She currently has responsibility for the regional and community development research areas within the department, including setting strategic direction for various data products, surveys, and other regional and local analysis. In addition, she directs the incorporation of regional information to monetary policy preparation for the Richmond Fed. Her work involves analyzing economic trends, writing for a variety of publications, and presenting on regional and national economic conditions. <coughs> Prior to joining the Richmond Fed, she worked as an economist in the Virginia Department of Planning and Budget and at ICF International in Washington, D.C. She received a BA from Williams College in 2001 and an MS in Applied Economics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2006. Please welcome Sonia to Sunday's Institute. Thank you, Arnie. I think this is on, right? Everybody can hear me? Okay. Um, so I prepared some things to talk about today and then went to lunch with a few people and realized that everything I prepared was the wrong thing. <laughs> so let me just please ask you to feel free to go ahead and ask questions. I'm going to start with a discussion, a short discussion, a level set sort of. Going in and out. Going in and out. Okay. Maybe I can just hold it in my hand. How's that? Is that better? Yeah. Okay. If that happens again, just wave, especially in the back. <laughs> just did? All right. Well, maybe, maybe if I switch sides. But the, maybe I just need to hold it. I can do that. No. Yeah, no. Well, let's see. Okay. Yeah, I actually It's definitely on. It's probably the receiver. Board. It's definitely on. I can, I can just take that one. That's fine. Anybody here? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This makes me feel like I'm about to start a rock concert. This is good. I can I can hold it. Yeah. It's not a problem. I might start singing, though. Can't be good. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start, like I said, with a discussion uh, of the national economy at level set, and then talk about Virginia and then talk about the areas within Virginia, but I'm gonna do that in a way that, um, well, so what I wanna do is I wanna talk a little bit specifically about the rural or small town of Virginia as compared to the larger metro area, um, and, and talk about some of the things that we've learned. Woven through all of this is going to be sort of understanding what we at the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond do and why we do what we do. Um, and I would please, like I said, encourage you to just ask questions at any time. Um, and I have an eye on the clock, so if we start getting too close to the hour, then I might um, then I might ask for um, to stop questions or give you the option to keep asking questions or I skip stuff at the end is also fine. Um, but of course, although I'm happy to answer questions, any views that I express are mine and not the views of the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond or the Federal Reserve System. Uh, my standing joke is that I'm considering getting that tattooed on my forehead. Uh, it, it, might, it might make things easier. So, you know, U.S. economy as a whole, where are we? Um, economic growth by the numbers actually looks pretty good. GDP is growing as anticipated, and I have a, a slide on that. Um, labor markets are tight by whatever measure you use. And sentiment indices have steadied now. Uh, I don't think we've gotten one in the last two weeks. 
Um, the purchasing managers index did come out, and that's quite a bit lower. Um, so we can talk about that. We can talk about, say, I don't know, hypothetically, the effect of a virus that might start in Wuhan, China. Um, on the other hand, you know, business investment actually has been soft. It's been soft for a couple of quarters. Um, there are still reports of lingering uncertainty. Certainly, the election is something that often weighs on people. And now we have this coronavirus. I think talking about the election now as a as a source of uncertainty, perhaps. Is, uh, is, is not what the key on people's mind. And then if you look at the Virginia economy, we've been growing as an economy, but we have been lagging the U.S., and that's been true since the end of this last recession in a way that it wasn't true prior to that. Okay, so, so let me start with the national economy. This is the broadest measure that we have of economic activity at the national level. It's gross domestic product. This is a chart of change, so it's percent change over the quarter, but it's seasonally adjusted. That's the blue bars, uh, the dark blue. And then the light blue at the, at the end is the range of expectations uh, for GDP growth of the members of the Federal Open Market Committee. So the 19, well, it should be 19, I guess it's 17 now, people who make monetary policy. So it's 12 <coughs> reserve bank presidents. We have 12 reserve banks, and all 12 presidents are on the FOMC. And then it should be seven members of the Board of Governors. Um, we have five now. But so it's those 17 people, their range of predictions for GDP growth. And you can see that it's around 2%. So I heard uh, I heard our director of research, Kartika Thraya, say the other day, um, you know, he, I think he was speaking to a group and he said, uh, you know, somebody wakes you up in the middle of the night and asks you what GDP growth will be. If you say 2%, you're likely to be, you know, about right. Um, and, and that's where we are. Now, if you look sort of over the long Longer term, why 2%? It's not just that it seems like a good number. You know, it's about productivity growth. It's about labor force participation. It's about population growth. You know, it's about the key things that that um, that sh that uh, um, make the economy grow, right? Um, so, so we were about 2% in the fourth quarter, and that was what is anticipated for the first quarter of this year. Again, without the effects, most of the national economy that I'm going to be talking about right now was without whatever effects that we see in the coronavirus. And, and, I, and I'm happy to talk about that, too. I'm guessing that is on people's minds. You know, some of those effects, um, even in the worst case, are going to be probably pretty short short lived as in we will whether it's one quarter or two we will make it up in the second or third quarter um, with manufacturing production and but some of them might actually be longer lasting if we think about some of the services or the travel that people decide not to engage in. <laughs> Um, okay, so employment. So we added 225,000 jobs in uh, in January. Let me well, let me also say that in this GDP number, about two, two thirds of this number is consumption expenditures, and and consumers have been buying, right? So we have seen some pretty solid growth in consumer spending. Um, why? Well, in part because of this. So we add maybe mostly because of this. We added 225,000 jobs in January um, over the course of. 2019, we added on average 176,000 jobs per month. Um, we added, uh, the year before that was actually over 220,000 jobs per month. We've actually, all of these numbers are more than enough to keep up with growth in the working age population. We've had years of, of employment growth. So not surprisingly then, um, the unemployment rate has continued to fall at 3.6 percent. So we've been bouncing somewhere between three and a half and 3.8 or 9 percent for months now, um, and that is the lowest rate that we've seen since the 60s. So in 1968, 69, we were at 3.4 percent, um, and this is the lowest that we've seen since then. So all measures, actually, no matter what you ask about, if you have a background in looking at labor market measures, you can ask about them, and I can tell you that just about every measure um, of unemployment is at or near historic lows. We can talk about labor force participation if you want to. Uh, we can talk about the JOLTS report. We can talk about all of the measures of unemployment at or near historic lows. And all of the measures of employment show strength. Um, in addition, so this is this is where I start to digress and I have to pay attention to the, to the clock. Um, so as already said, I have been uh, in the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond since 2008. I started two months before Bear Stearns collapsed. Um, yeah. And in all of that time, I've been working with regional data and working with economic data. 
What I had not done before starting at the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond um, was work with qualitative data at all, right? And one of the things that we do is we engage with businesses across the Fed Fifth Federal Reserve District, which is North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, most of West Virginia, D.C., and Maryland. So we engage with businesses across that area to understand what's happening right now on the ground. Why do we do that? Well, for one thing, it is March 1st and we still only have fourth quarter GDP data, right? So for one thing, even national data is lagged. When we get to state data, now this is the worst, the worst time of year to talk about state employment data, and I'll tell you why, but we are super lagged on the state employment data. So regional data is even more lagged often than the national data is. Um, also, data can give you information, right? It can, get, it can tell you what's happening, but it doesn't tell you why. So I can sit here and tell you that we've had two quarters of decline in business fixed investment in structures. Okay, very interesting. We can talk about that, but I can't really tell you why. I can dig into those numbers and find by industry. Maybe I can look by region, um, but understanding why we've seen that decline, that's where we use our businesses. Um, and then in addition, uh, we we need the, um, the kind of current, so, so so basically what we, um, what we look at is the data that um, also we don't necessarily have uh, in the numbers, right? So one thing is that a lot of the data is lagged, um, we don't have a lot of regional data, and the data doesn't provide the context. I'm saying all of this because usually as I talk, I tell stories, um, and I tell stories from the businesses that we talk to, and that comes out even more when I talk about our surveys. But this number, all of this data is consistent with everything that we hear. If you go into a room and you ask people how many have tried to hire in the last six months, and however many raise their hand, it rose from about half to about three quarters. Now it's almost the whole room that'll also say they had challenges hiring in the last six months of their last hire. Firms are reporting a lot of difficulty finding workers to fill the positions that they have. So anyway, all of this is consistent. Now, I don't think I put in anything about wages, and I'm not, I'm not going to talk about that now, but I'm happy to, to talk about wage growth as well and what we've seen there. Um, again, so this is before the most recent news has come out, but you know, towards the um, towards the end of 2018, middle to end of 2018, we saw some really, or middle, I should say, spring to middle of 2018, we saw some real strength in a lot of the reports that we were getting from firms. So this is a measure of consumer sentiment. Um, from the uh, from University of Michigan, uh, and so you know it's kind of a sense of how consumers are feeling, and it's a little hard to tell. It's a little volatile, but you can see it sort of um, uh, kind of go up really 2017 and somewhat in 2018. Then you see this decline at the end of 2018 and as we started 2019, um, and that's consistent sort of across measures. This is one um, that, the, that the Duke University Fuqua, Fuqua School does of CFOs, um, and again. And this one declined um, towards the end of 2018, and then, uh, and sorry, the end of 2019, be beginning of 2019, and then started to jump up again. Um, I'm having a really hard time with years, I have to say. Like, I'm trying to remember what year what happened. I still feel like 1990 should be like 10 years ago. Um, anyway, so, uh, so. Uh, this I guess struggle like 2018, 2019, uh, but regardless, we saw this decline in sort of expectations in 2018, and we saw some improvement throughout 2019. Um, and in fact, most firms and these measures talk about kind of starting this year a little more optimistic. Okay, so this is great, right? But I can't tell you any more about this number, but this. The numbers I can tell you more about are these. So the light blue line, this is, a, this is an index of manufacturing activity. The light blue is actually done at the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. So every month we survey manufacturers and we survey service sector, service providers or, or retailers, both. Um, we ask them, did things get better, worse, or stay the same across a number of measures, employment, shipments, sales, revenues, um, every month. And the, the light blue line is the share of people who said that things got better minus the share who said that things got worse. It's also kind of, we did a three month moving average. So anything above zero for the light blue line indicates expansion, anything below zero indicates contraction. The dark blue line is a similar one done by the Institute for Supply Management for the entire US. 
Um, so one thing to note, and for them, they scale theirs by 50, so for them, anything above 50 indicates expansion, below 50 indicates contraction. Um, one thing to note is that the, U, the fifth district seems to follow the U.S. pretty well. Um, we both saw this, like I said, improvement um, in 2018 that sort of fell towards the end of 2018 and into 2019 um, and then increased again. Actually, when we were in the spring of 2018, in our measure, we had some of the most persistently high numbers in that manufacturing index that we have ever seen. And it's however long ago 1993 was, that's the history of this series. Um, and so what is that? Like, it's like 25 years, right? Yeah, like 27 years. Okay, so for the 27 year history, we saw some of the most persistently high measures of that index, and then it started to fall. Um, so February was actually a little bit down. Oh, then we started to improve again. So like flatten out or improve a little bit um, in the beginning of this year. February was a little down. Um, so actually, manufacturers were a little bit sort of more uncertain. Um, you know, one textile mill from North Carolina said um, they had an overall slow start to the year um, with all markets except one was below normal, but orders were picking up in February. Um, a furniture manufacturer from Virginia said tariffs have had a significant negative impact on our company. So one of the things that we were really hearing about from manufacturers in 2018 and 2019 was about um, tariffs. So the, and especially those with a, with a global footprint. Um, and then, he, then this one went on to say the coronavirus outbreak in China has also had an undetermined to date but clearly negative impact for the sake of our company um, and millions of people in China and other countries. Um, you know, we did, we did have a fabricated metal manufacturer from Virginia said, I, I like this quote, impeachment, coronavirus, just slow, you pick one. <laughs> I was like, that's not the point of these surveys. You're supposed to tell me. Um, <clears throat> Anyway, so, so again, still some comments about uncertainty, still some comments about tariffs, um, but we've seen a little, we saw a little bit of improvement among manufacturers. You know, service providers uh, did not decline as much. Um, they're sort of, a, they're a little bit uh, steadier than, than the manufacturers have been. Um, you know, like a consume computer and, appli uh, and appliance stores, it seems to be moving along okay. I believe we're starting the year stronger than last year. Um, Commercial real estate it continues to be strong in most markets. Residential real estate also strong. Um, people are in, with the most common comment we get in the service sector is challenges finding labor. And actually that's true in the manufacturing sector as well. Outside of tariffs, fi difficulty finding labor is the most common comment that we get there. So everything that I just said is consistent with Virginia. So we don't hear things in Virginia um, that are all that different from what we hear on the U.S. as a whole or from what we hear in the 5th District. Um, and in fact, the 5th District itself represents the U.S. pretty well. Um, so this is payroll employment in Virginia. So moving outside of the, the whole district and just into Virginia. Um, Employment in Virginia, you can see, has been the slower growth. So anything above zero is growth, right? Because this is year over year percent change. But it's been growing more slowly than the U.S. since the recession. Before the recession, we were generally growing faster than the U.S. Um, so that 1.1% growth December to December um, translated into 45,000 jobs for the state. Now, why am I telling you that this is the worst possible time to talk about uh, payroll employment at the state level? Actually, this is not the worst possible time. I think March 10th is probably the worst possible time because we get revisions. So we don't have January or February data for the states now. Um, I guess February, fine. February ended yesterday. but. Um, March, I mean January, we also don't have. In the middle of March, we get not only the January data, but then we get the entire past history of the data revised. So they benchmark that data. Um, and at the state level, it can change, right? So I don't think that year over year percent change wise, we're going to see a lot of change. Um, the U.S. as a whole was revised down. Again, you know, this doesn't really change what we look at with respect to trend, but we did add, add fewer jobs as a country last year than we had originally thought. Um, so that'll kind of translate into Virginia as well. Um, but I, there are reasons to believe based on some withholding numbers, tax withholding numbers, and to think that we're actually going to see the Virginia numbers come up a little, um, but maybe not quite to where the U.S. has been in terms of growth. So we'll see. So so that's like, I think it's like March 
11th or 12th or something that that, that, that those numbers come out. So I so we have January numbers for the U.S., but you know for per, for comparison purposes, I'm, um, I'm I'm leaving December at, at, at the U.S. So we did have that little bump, um, a little bump in uh, in 2015 and 2016, and I can tell you what that was. That was professional and business services. So in Virginia, this is the share of employment in the state by industry. So, for example, 17. This is not farm, and it's civilian. Important in Virginia, right? Civilian not farm. Um, so 17.9% of employment in Virginia in December of 2019 was in government. And then 15% of U.S. employment was in government. I am sure that every single person in this room is shocked to hear that Virginia has a higher share of government employment than any other <laughs> Shocked. The other thing Virginia has, though, is we are consistently either number one or number two receiver of contract dollars. And we vie with California for the number one or number two spot. And their economy is like four, four and a half times ours. So as a share of economic activity in the state, those contract dollars make a, are a big deal. Where do most of those go? Into professional business services, which is 18.7% of employment in Virginia. Now, there's a lot of other stuff in there, like most information technology. That information, 1.6%, that's not information technology. That's like print media. It's been declining for years, um, like publications and that. It's declining across the U.S. and Virginia and all of our states. Uh, but this professional business services is big. So you can often say, you know, so goes professional business services, so goes Virginia. And that has not been growing at the same state, at the same rate, I'm sorry, as it has in the U.S. We have seen consistently lower growth in professional business services employment compared to the U.S. Now, you know, if you look at the recession of the early 90s, you look at the recession of the early 2000s, you look at the first three years after recession, and so for us after this recession, that's before the sequestration, right? Um, uh, or maybe it's like right before, yeah, the sequester was what, 2011, 2012, 2013. So if you look at like 2009 to 2012, so you look at, you take those three recessions, you take the three years after the recession, we never saw professional business services grow as an industry in the state like we did after this recession, like we did in the early 90s and early 2000s. That growth rate was about half. Um, so this sector never pulled us out of this recession the way that it pulled us out of past recessions. Um, but this is really, it's really important to look at like this. This is the chart we just looked at. So this is industry structure. To look at this before we look at year over year growth, right? Because like that information sector, that's 2.5% decline. That seems like a lot. Um, but that's actually just about 1,600 jobs. While the professional business services, that 1.3% um, is about 10,000 jobs for the state um, because it's such a big share. Um, and then natural resources and mining, you know, added what about 400 jobs for the state. The other thing that this chart, so uh, so one thing is that you can't, you know, this doesn't show shares, it doesn't show number of jobs added, right? It's percent growth. Um, but the other thing is that it masks um, differences within a sector, within a super sector. Um, so I did a presentation once and um, this poor woman has no idea, but I don't even know her name, so I guess it's okay. She has no idea I use her as an example. Um, but I did, a, I did a presentation in, in South, West Virginia, South Side. It was like South. Yeah, it was like I think it was like Martinsville area. It was like South Side Virginia, not Southwest. Um, and and I presented something like this, and she was very very upset that education and health services are together. She said like when you look at in our area, you know I can't believe the Fed would look at that as a, as one sector. Um, and I it felt a little like I don't know what is the word is it churlish I don't know to say that like well that's BLS data <laughs> it's not Fed data it's the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, but we can look at this obviously much more disaggregated. I mean, my answer to her was yes. Let's talk about what it looks like within that sector. But if I put all of that on one slide, you would not be able to read it. Um, so, so we talked about that. But like, you look at trade, transportation, and utilities. Very important sector, right? So that's. 16.6% of employment in Virginia, um, and we saw that 0.6% decline. That is not in all cross, right? So we did lose 300 jobs in wholesale, but that was like a really small percent decline, 0.3%, and it's not a trend. That one's been sort of bouncing around zero growth, you know, plus or minus. 5,000 jobs lost in retail. That was negative 1.2%, and we've seen a steady decline in retail employment for a couple of years now. Not shocking, right? 
Um, on the other hand, we had 1,400 jobs that were gained over the year in transportation, warehousing, and utilities. Right, so we've had steady growth there. So these sub super sectors also mask differences within the sector. Yes. When you say government as a sector, yes. Yes, the second one. Who work in Virginia? Not necessarily live in Virginia, but work in Virginia. Yeah. What about education? So, well, let me. I, I'm going to. Because that's. Yes. So let me piggyback on. I'm going to. Yes. So first. Um, Government includes state and local and, and federal, and state and local makes up the bulk of that, just like it does in every single state. Um, school teachers, public school teachers are in government, for the most part. There are some state differences, so it's categorized, but for the most part, let's call it that they're, they're in government. Um, but private, like any private institution, those people working there would be in, uh, in education health services. Yeah. Uh, okay, so this is my very favorite chart that everybody else hates, but I'm the presenter and so I get to put it in. Um, it's index. What this is is employment. Also, I have like two colorblind people in my department. I don't know if that's a lot as a share. Like, I don't know if that's consistent with the population, but they really hate this chart. Um, so it's this is employment index to 100 in December of 2007 for each industry, right? Okay, so these are all the industries. To the extent that they are back then above this horizontal line, they've regained the loss of the recession. Okay, so I'm going to point out two things here. One is, if you can look at this total, and then you can look at this professional business services red, you can see, so goes professional business services, so goes total. Those really do move together quite a bit. Actually, maybe I'll point out three things. You can also see this education health services um, does not exhibit the same sort of cyclical behavior that most other industries do. It's very interesting. But the other thing is, over the course of the recession, we had like 38,000 jobs in the state that were lost in the goods producing sectors, which I'm calling manufacturing, mining and logging, and uh, construction. Where's construction here? None of those no, none of those lines are back above the horizontal line, right? So now, of course, they're all different, right? So mining and logging, well, that went back above. That sort of varies with energy prices. Um, uh, construction peaked in 2005 and then, and then came down. Manufacturing has seen sort of a secular decline in employment since what, the late 80s or early 90s. So they show different trends, but nonetheless, um, most of those jobs have not come back. And that is important driver of growth if you look at the different the different parts of Virginia um, and, and you look at who's growing and who isn't, or across states too. Like we look, we compare ourselves to North Carolina, or maybe maybe at the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond we just compare Virginia to North Carolina because we cover both states. Um, they are side by side, and one of them has been growing really strongly and one of them has not, right? North Carolina has seen a lot of growth. And a lot of people, you know, might think, oh, well, that's in manufacturing. We think the manufacturing plants coming in. Now, South Carolina has actually grown in manufacturing and other, and service sector stuff. But North Carolina, most of that growth has been in the service sector. And a lot of it has been in professional business services. Okay, so I can talk more about that, but I'm going to, in the interest of time, um, keep going. So this is just a just to show sort of where the metro areas are and where the micro areas are. Now, um, so one thing is that you can see that most of Virginia is covered in either a metro or a micro area. Um, if you look at like um, the Northern Virginia is like 37% of employment in the state. Um, Hampton Roads is about seven, about 20%. Richmond's about 17%. That's in the MSAs. So if you look at those three metro areas, you have most of the employment in the state. So it's worth sort of sort of keeping that in mind. And then uh, then I want to talk about these white areas too, right? Um, and and these smaller, the smaller, the micro areas or the smaller metro areas. But so so before it's nice to look at this map before we look at this. So this is year-over-year -year employment growth by metro area. 
Um, so again, you know, Winchester has been pretty fast growing metro area um, for years. It's it's picked up a little bit, but uh, but it's also a really small share of employment, right? So that 2.2% growth is around 1,400 jobs for the state. Um, on the other hand, for Northern Virginia, that 1.3% growth means over 20,000 jobs for the state over the course of the year. Um, Richmond was was 12,000 jobs for the state over the year. Um, Virginia Beach has picked up a little bit, right? So Virginia Beach has generally been growing but more slowly um, than other metro areas in the state. Um, I guess it still is, but it's actually picked up. It was kind of hovering around zero for a while. Uh, Roanoke, that's a recent phenomenon. Actually, as you can see in this chart, so this is year-over-year -year percent change. So if you look up here, this is exactly what we just looked at in that chart. This is the 10-year growth, right? So this is the extent to which a metro area has actually sustained that growth. To the extent they're in a top right area, they have not only grown recently, but they have been growing for years. And Roanoke is not there, right? So Roanoke has seen some recent pickup in growth, but has not been growing as strongly as, say, a, Win a Winchester or even a Richmond or a Northern Virginia. And then the size of the bubble is by share of employment in the state, as we as we talked about. Now, yes. You, you mentioned twenty percent Hampton Roads and thirty-seven percent Yeah. Where's Hampton Roads? Hampton Roads is here. So your two numbers were thirty-seven percent and twenty-seven percent. Yeah. You said that. You said total employment. You said that's growth. This is, yes, so this is year-over-year year percent change here. So here's like the 1.2% of Northern Virginia or whatever, 2% of Richmond. And then this is uh, growth over the last 10 years. The bubble size is total employment. So the bigger it is, the more employment there is in the place. Yeah? Do you have that broken down to Because it's both Hampton and Richmond. Uh, and as well as you see a high millennial growth versus other areas. So let's see. We can't break this down by age, as far as I know. So this is employment that's submitted by the um, by the company. What we can do is look at employment by age by where you live. That's the unemployment rate. I mean, we can do that by metro area. Um, I haven't, and what I'm wondering is if we can even get that at the um, interval that we that we would want to. Like, I'm wondering if that's actually census data that then we would have like every three years um, or every year, but it's sort of we've got a high margin of error. Um, yeah. So, but this one by by employer, I don't I don't think that we can do that. There are other ways. There are other ways to get at sort of employment growth in an area by by age, um, and I'm thinking me. So what? This data is like um, any firm that is subject to the unemployment insurance claims program has to submit to the Virginia Employment Commission their uh, their total employment, right? So that's the payroll employment. Then the Bureau of Labor Statistics takes it from all the employment commissions and pulls it together. That we don't have by age, as far as I know. Maybe they do, but maybe the VEC does. Um, I, but I don't think that an employer would submit the age of the person working. I think they just submit numbers. But the unemployment rate comes from a survey of households across the U.S. And then you ask somebody, are you working? Are you not working? You know, it's a series of questions. And for that, they do ask, like, age. Um, so that might be one way to get it. But I think there are other data sources as well. But this one we don't. Yeah? Right, just to piggyback on that, this is employment numbers. This has nothing to do with wage. Correct. Okay, just wanna, because that, that becomes an important factor. Not only is it employment numbers, it's also just employment numbers by companies that sub as a sample. Okay, but let's assume that the sample is good. So, okay, so a sample of companies um, that submit to the employment commission. So it's not going to include Uber drivers, for example. The the, the uh, people who are employed in the gig economy are not included in this. So it's missing. It, you know, yeah. Or it doesn't include, actually, this would include part-time as well. So if you if you submit that you have somebody working on your payrolls, they would be included in this. The way that we get at all of that, well, not the gig economy, but the way that we would get it like part-time or underemployed or is, is pretty much through the household survey, through the other survey. Yes? What if you try to integrate the data also with like cost of living and increased wages and... 
kind of correlated to see which areas are, you know, like where are the people actually being, you know, are they getting a little richer or poorer? Mm -hmm. or yeah, we can do that. <coughs> we can do that. Now, the more, if you, if you say by where, you mean where by industry, we can do well, that. I'd like to be able to drill down the industry in a specific IC for this process. Yeah. Also, yeah, I'm not sure how deeply we can go here, but the QC depth, so there, there's actually other, there's other data that we can use to get at that. Geographically, it's a little harder um, when you get into this bucket. It's actually easier to look at drill down by industry for a large area than it is to drill down in a small area or even to get small area data because the smaller the area gets, the, the less data is available. Um, but, but yeah, that is something that, that we could do. It's just I don't do it here. Okay, so um, so on it, so this is the unemployment rate. I, I mentioned that for the uh, for the U.S. we're at the lowest unemployment rate for the '60s. Virginia, this 2.6 percent is certainly low, but we got down to 2.1 percent in 2000. So it's not the lowest we've seen in Virginia, but um, but it's still low. And we have consistently, though we've been growing less quickly, we have consistently had a lower unemployment rate than the U.S. Um, we have a highly educated population. <coughs> We have a pretty diverse industry base, uh, and we also have that buffer of Northern Virginia. I mentioned I started in 2008, uh, and you know, pretty soon thereafter, we had this you know housing crisis. I don't know if you guys remember that. Uh, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. But actually, you know, if you talk to college students, they actually don't remember. Like you have to start by talking about the financial crisis. When I say I started two months before Bear Stearns collapsed, in a group of 22 year olds, they're like. What's, what, what do you mean? What's that? They weren't they weren't listening to NPR like uh, watching CNBC like everybody else, um, watching that money market dip below one. Anyway, uh, so okay, so I now I completely lost my point. Oh yeah, so when we were when I started and we got we had the mortgage crisis right. We're looking at delinquencies. We're looking at foreclosures. Um, the worst part of Virginia for delinquencies and foreclosures was the was Northern Virginia, right? That was the that was the highest delinquency, highest foreclosure. Now you had Hampton Roads, right? Those beach houses, second, mostly second homes and stuff, certainly. But, uh, but the worst was Northern Virginia, that still had the lowest unemployment rate, right, in the state. So this, this has pretty much looked like this, the, just the colors the entire time. So this is unemployment rate by county. The entire time that I, the 12 years I've worked at the Fed, it's looked like this. But these numbers have changed, right? But you can see that unemployment, you know, you have 2.6% at the state level, but it varies a lot within regions. And so when we think about growth, right, the two most natural ways to break it down is one by industry or two by geography. Like how are people doing um, in, you know, by geography? So, you know, certainly um, if you look at Southwest Virginia, other than Scott County there, but you look at Southwest Virginia, Southside of Virginia, it's some of the highest unemployment. Um, Lancaster County, where we are, was 3.9% in December. Um, but this is a super seasonal area. So actually what I find is that every single time, I, I have not spent a lot of time in this area, I confess. Every time I start to pull together a presentation on a new area, what I really find is what I don't know. Right? So I, I looked at this series, um, and December through March has really high, no, I'm sorry, December through March has high unemployment. And then you see it really fall, and then it rises again. Um, Northumberland was 3.6% in, in December, um, but it'll be on the upswing until April. And I'm assuming that this is two things, and you all tell me if I'm wrong here. I'm assuming one is that you're on the water, and so it's seasonal, right? In the summer and in the fall, you have higher, on a higher employment, lower unemployment. <laughs> And then I'm also assuming that it's because it's small, right? So we see that seasonality in some of the other um, counties in Virginia, but not as not as strong swings. Um, and I assume that that was because you guys are small. Yes. Yeah, a lot of agriculture. Yeah. Agriculture. Okay. Yes. Um, I don't know if it's taken into account, but by the census data, we dropped uh, about seven percent of the population. Primarily the middle ages, the 30 to 40 area, and how would that affect? So actually, in some ways, that is actually easier to see here. So this is employment to population, because the, the problem with this number, this unemployment rate, um, is that it, 
what is it? It's, it's the number of people who are not working and have looked for work in the last four weeks divided by those people plus the employed. Because those people plus the employed are the labor force. But then what if you aren't working but have looked in the last 12 months, but not in the last four weeks? Okay, what if you're just discouraged? What if you just gave up looking, right? So these are all people that are out of the labor force. Um, now, we can break this down nationally for sure, but also um, on some, to, in some cases by region, um, to understand why people, or who's out of the labor force, right? And we certainly can do it with less timely, or less timely data. Um, but if you want to sort of understand age dynamics, this one is just cleaner, right? So this is the number of people who are employed divided by the population. This is 16 years and older. Now the 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 the, um, uh, the relative, like the colors of the map, doesn't change that much actually. If you do 16 to 64 or 16 to 54, um, and this is something that we were doing because a lot of the more rural areas skew older. Um, and of course, the older you are, the less likely you are to be participating in the labor force. Um, but uh, but so this kind of helps helps to get at get at that a little bit. Um, but I would say you know, I, I okay. So actually, let me keep going, and then we'll we'll kind of we'll circle back to that a little bit. Um, someone out here, okay. Uh, okay. So so one of the um, things that we started looking at. All right. Let me let me put it this way. You know. For years, we've known that employment and population are moving towards the um, largest metro areas and the larger metro areas at the expense of not just the rural areas, but the smaller metro areas or cities, right? The smaller cities. Um, I mean, like, we have been moving out of rural areas since the country was founded, right? So that has just been this long-term trend. But, but then we also are moving towards towards bigger metro areas. So we've known that. Uh, one of the things we started to try to understand a little bit better a couple of years ago, the beginning of last year, is why. Um, so let me say, we, let me see, is that next? Okay, so what is this, what is this rural-urban I don't know, divide, I mean, that's hard, right? Like, I, I don't like the word divide um, because I don't think it's that clear. Because, okay, so you look at this, right? So this is employment, the population growth um, from 2011 to 2017. Uh, the the, the uh, solid lines are the rural and the um, dotted lines are the urban. Okay, so rural and urban here are not rural and urban. So what we did was we took these codes that the USDA has, um, and they would they have one through nine, and they would call one through three urban and four through nine rural, and we did one and two urban. What does this mean? Because obviously, I'm, how many people know what two is in the USDA code? I'm just kidding. Um, so, but in this case, rural includes counties and metro areas like Charlottesville, like Blacksburg, Harrisonburg, Danville, and Martinsville. In fact, the only place places in Virginia that are urban in this categorization are counties that are in Richmond, Virginia Beach, DC, Roanoke, Lynchburg, and Kingsport, Bristol. <coughs> right? So so I wouldn't consider Blacksburg or Char well, Char Blacksburg and Charlottesville is weird, right? They're weird because of the students. Well Harrisburg a little bit too. But like I don't know that I'd call Danville rural. Yeah, I mean yeah, it's like a, but it's a town, right? Surrounded by rural areas. Charlottesville, Blacksburg. And like it actually gets even a little bit starker as you look across our our district um, in, in some states like South Carolina. Um, but why did we do this? We did it because small towns are suffering population loss too and employment loss um, or at least growth that's not as strong as uh, as what the larger urban areas are. And so we sort of were, we were trying to understand why that is. Um, so that's true for job growth too, right? So this is year over year percent change in job growth. So when we talk about sort of these differences between rural and urban areas, this is this is what we're talking about. So why does the Fed care, right? Um, so I, I thought I should spend a minute sort of talking about why why we started looking at this. Um, okay, so one is we have 3.6 percent. We have the lowest unemployment rate since the 60s. We have a very tight labor market. One, one piece of the Fed's dual mandate is maximum employment. That does not mean, so, so that, that's our mandate, right? We have a mandate for maximum employment, stable prices, and then moderate long-term interest rates. But when you hear about the dual mandate, it's maximum employment and stable prices. What is maximum employment? It's not 0% unemployment. 
It's the level of employment that's consistent with maximum sustainable economic growth. Well, how do you figure out what that is without understanding the labor markets that are underlying whatever that number is, right? So, so, so are we sort of, um, are we thinking about maximum employment in a way that um, that represents sort of the way that the cut the labor markets in the country are sort of interacting? Um, I mean, I mean, the other thing is that, you know, uh, do we have what? What I really mean by that is, do we have areas or populations where we have, say, employment to population ratios that are quite a bit lower? So, if you look at that employment, I think I have this number actually. Um, Employment to population ratio, yeah. So in Virginia, this more urban employment to population ratio was 63%, I think that was 2018 number, versus 53.4%. This is 16 to 64. So it includes 54 to 64. Uh, 50, yeah, 54 to 64, yeah. Um, but not older than that. So that is a 10 point difference in employment to population ratio between the more urban and the more rural, right? So is there a way that we could add people into the labor force by understanding the challenges that rural areas are facing um, and, and sort of finding a way to give people, and, and what is it, right? That's really important to know what it is, and I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, but to give people the opportunity to participate in the, in the labor market. Um, so that's one. The, I mean, the other thing is that this tight labor market tends to, tends to help people on the fringes, right? So as you see a, uh, if you see a down, during a downturn, the people who are the most hit are the lower educated, are the lower income, um, are the people who um, who had like you are who are the hardest then to to bring back into the labor market in an upturn, right? And so never waste a tight labor market, right? Like right now we are seeing wages go up more for entry level workers than for anybody else. Um, we are seeing minority populations. We are seeing rural areas, even we're seeing improvement in areas um, that are sort of sometimes the last to be brought back into an expansion. So we have an opportunity here, that's one. The other is that, so um, in the 1970s, the Congress passed the Community Reinvestment Act, uh, which required banks, or I should say required regulators to examine banks based partly on their um, the, cre the um, access to credit of low to moderate income communities. So they want to make sure that banks are lending throughout their footprint um, and, and, are, and everybody has sort of the ac access to credit, right? So this is a very simple way to discuss the CRA. And if you read the newspaper, you hear a lot about the CRA right now, right? Because we're in the middle of the CRA re re modernization. As a part of that, as a part of requiring every reserve bank to have examination staff that goes to banks and looks at their lending to low to moderate income communities. Um, they already had to do safety and soundness, right? But this is low to moderate income communities. Every reserve bank has to have uh, an, an area that understands those communities, right? So we have a, a mandate, actually, to understand the economic conditions that are facing low to moderate income communities throughout the country, but for us, throughout the Fifth Federal Reserve District. And actually, that's a piece that I took over. So um, we were talking earlier about sort of some changes and stuff that we've had. We've had a lot of changes in the last two years. And, and, and one of the things that I do now is I have responsibility not just for the people who do the regional economic analysis, but also for the people who are, who are analyzing community development, and, and economic activity and sort of demographics um, throughout the Fifth Federal Reserve District. So that's the other way that we get at this. And then we just, um, you know, we right now we, we have a president who came in in, December, in January of 2018 who um, has a real interest in engaging with the community. He wants to be out there and he wants to be out there in those white counties as much as he wants to be out there in those blue counties. So yeah, if, you, if we want, the reason why I focused on metro areas is because it's a really large share of employment. So if you're looking at employment in Virginia and you want to look at trends, you have to look at those metro areas. Um, but if we want to really understand what's happening in the state or in the district or in the U.S., um, we have to sort of look at what's happening um, throughout, throughout the, the state. Um, okay, so what have we learned then? And, you know, we're still learning. <laughs> I mean, 
you know, this is it. How do we learn? We learn by some reading, some data analysis, some engaging with communities, sending different people out to engage with different parts of different communities and try to learn what's, ha what's happening there. So there are some themes that we developed. One is clearly education. Shocking, I know. Um, but educational attainment is lower in rural areas. Now this is share of people with a bachelor's, right? This is one measure of educational attainment. Um, and now I will, I, I can talk about other measures that we look at as well. This is the simplest one too. Um, and you can, like, we have areas of counties in Virginia where like, over 75% of, of people who live there have a bachelor's. And then we have areas of Virginia where it's under 10%. In the US as a whole, 22% of rural areas have a bachelor's compared to 35% of urban areas. Um, and in Virginia, it's about 21 versus 39. Um, now, why do we care then? Yes? Isn't that a little bit of a ticket in the egg type of thing? You know, the fact that people actually have opportunities in those areas and therefore draw people in with a higher level of education. Yep. So those people are there. It, you know, it's kind of like it's, it's self perpetuating right? Yeah, yeah. I sat there in a, um, in a meeting with a somebody who worked for the community college, not the president, but somebody who worked closely with the president, to a president and a firm. And the community college was saying, yeah, we educate these people that's what our measure of success is, right? It is, it is giving people the tools they need to think. I'm sorry, not just we educate them, they get a job, right? Our measure of success is, and this is like technical school, right? So it's not, but like, is, is the extent to which they get a job soon after leaving. And the firm said, well, I think your measure, or no, it was an economic, sorry, it was economic developer. The economic developer in that region was like, no, no, we need them to stay here. Right? Our measure of success is the share of people here who have some sort of degree, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and this is like, this is the standard, you know, sort of economist debate, right? It's not even a debate, actually. Um, most economists would advocate for people-based solutions, not place-based solutions. Why do we care about places? We care about the people in those places, right? So if you educate people, if you focus on education, and you focus on looking at a middle schooler and saying, hey, middle schooler, here are all the options that are available to you. You know, we have a 50% graduation rate from our college, or maybe 55 and six. So 55% of people who enter a four-year school graduate within six years. Right? Okay, so what about those 45% people? If we talk about student loans, if we want to have a conversation about sort of where people are after finishing school and what the opportunities are for them, we have to talk about that, that share of people that are graduating. Because if you look at this, there's a really good reason to go and get a bachelor's degree, right? So this is the median earnings over your lifetime by degree. And in the US, in, I mean, sorry, in Virginia, you know, $40,000 difference between actually double, right? So getting a bachelor's degree doubles your median lifetime earnings um, compared to having just a high school degree. In addition, and I, you, I can make these slides available to you if you don't have them already, um, so I'm going to skip through these a, a little bit in the interest of time, but let's look at this. So when you have a bachelor's degree, your unemployment rate, your likelihood of being unemployed is much lower, even in a downturn. Um, than it is with certainly less than high school, but even high school um, and some college or high school and no college, right? So, so it's not even just that you know in a given moment you're more likely to be employed. It's that over time your labor market outcomes are better. Yes. So, quick question: When you say college, is that broad definition including? Sadly, no. I mean, yes. yes. Yeah. Well, so, and the problem is that this particular data, if we break it down by earnings, or it's some college or associates, those outcomes, I'm willing to bet, are rather different. You know, starting college and not finishing it is very different from getting a, a technical degree. Yeah, and so we have other ways. So the problem is that, like, community colleges, like, even um, gathering data for community colleges, how they measure success 
is very difficult because they do so many things for so many different people. You know, maybe they take in high school students and they supplement sort of the, the, high, the high schools. Um, maybe they really focus on transferring, right? So some community colleges are focused on you do a year or two here and then you can transfer to a four-year education. We're kind of bridging the gap between high school and, and a four-year college. Um, and some are really working with industry and saying, hey, let's design a program. Like we, I, I talked to a community college and they were like, we don't have the funding to use the technology that these firms have now. And the firm's like, well, they're working on two-year-old technology. And by the time they educate somebody, that's going to be three-year-old technology. And we're trying to move to the next generation. Next generation is in a generation more than a year. Like <laughs> a two-year generation. Um, you know, we're working on the next step. So they're not they're not training the, the kids on the technology that we have today. Um, and so, but so there are firms that are working really closely with community colleges to to do that. So that's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. And I always feel that you know I look at these numbers and I believe I don't believe that it is a irrational decision for a parent to say I want my kid to go to a four year school because of this. On the other hand, you have forty five percent of kids that are not graduating. Um, so I have, so I have an eight-year-old. I have an eight-year-old and a five-year-old. So when my eight-year-old was about four, she saw my um, college uh, reunion sticker on the refrigerator. And it's a purple cow, so she was all excited about it. And she was like, what is that? And I said, it's my reunion sticker. And she said, Mommy, am I going to college? And I was like, yeah, you're going to college. I, my, my grandmother, well, so I have one grandmother who had her first kid when she was 16 and got married at 15. But on the other side, my grandmother actually went to college um, during the Great Depression, right? So, you know, and she was educated. My parents got college degrees. My husband was like, yeah, you're going to college. And then it was like, hang on a second, post-secondary education. <laughs> I was like, you don't have to go to college, right? Like, you have to learn how to learn. You have to learn math. You have to do something, some technical stuff. But no, you don't actually have to go to a four-year college. You have to do something after high school, though, post-secondary education. Anyway, then she, I mean, she's like four years old, right? So she's like, oh, my God. Like, I'm, I'm walking away from this conversation. I don't even know why I engaged with that mother. Uh, anyway. uh, okay, so... Um, and education also matters for regions. All right, so... Um, yeah, so I mean, evidence suggests that everyone benefits from having more skilled workers around too. I mean, this is, again, like I could actually talk for a really long time about this slide alone. Um, this alone is an entire literature in economics. Um, but again, in the interest of time,